good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for giving up your Sunday afternoon, but I can't imagine anything better than being here this afternoon with Sandy Powell, OBE, our leading costume designer in film. I'm going to say it. I've said it. There we go. I've said it. Um, so um, I'm going to... I've got a few slides to show. Um, I'm going to begin at the beginning. I think I get the impression that when you were sort of growing up, Clothing was sort of being made at home, and there was sort of sewing happening. Sandy's mum is with, with us in the audience this <laughs> morning. <laughs> <laughs> so were you always kind of surrounded by the making of clothing? I think I was. I mean, I think my, my interest came for clothes from a very early age where, you know, my mum, um, used to make clothes for myself and my sister. And I really enjoyed that whole process and learning about that process. And I remember particularly going... John Lewis, John Lewis, <laughs> to choose the patterns, like going through the simplicity pattern books and looking at the patterns and picking the patterns and then choosing the fabrics. And when we were really little, we had to, me and my sister had to wear the same fabrics, didn't we, in the same colour. Sometimes I think you reverse the, reverse the, the bits, where there was a bit of trim in one colour. They got reversed for bras and a different way for me. But I mean, just that whole process I really enjoyed. And then wanted to learn how to do it myself, and then Mum taught me how to sew and use a machine, and then eventually how to follow a you know a simple Vogue pattern, and, and started started making clothes. And then prior to that, I was making doll clothes. Yeah. yeah. Did you did you go? Were you taken to the cinema as a as a child, or, or the theatre at, at all? Were you sort of seeing things on the screen or the stage that you thought, oh, this is kind of in, an interesting world? I'm not sure. I thought about costumes and clothes as a as a career path as early as that but I certainly was, was taken to the theatre and the cinema and TV and all of that and I remember really enjoying all of that and watching those things I mean I think I think probably Mary Poppins might have been the first film I saw in the cinema and but I, certainly I mean loving yeah loving sort of performance yeah theatre and film definitely and how, how incredible that you could do Mary Poppins Returns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I talked about that a lot when I was doing the yeah. Mary Poppins press. So. Um, but it was, it was more about actually craft and making things, you know, sewing yeah. and making things and painting and drawing and that sort of stuff. And I think very strongly that really feeds into what you, what you then continue to do. Yeah. Um, but I read that it was seeing um, uh, Lindsay Kemp's Flowers on, on stage at the Roundhouse? It was, that in, was in, kind in of about me. 1976, I think. Okay. Seeing Lindsay Kemp on stage at the Roundhouse, and I knew about Lindsay Kemp because I was an obsessive David Bowie fan, and I'd read that David Bowie had learned to do what he did, did through Lindsay Kemp, yes, and I'd yes. heard of this person, Lindsay Kemp, I knew he didn't live in the UK. And then I'd read about his work, and then he was at the Roundhouse, so I went, I went to see that show, and it was kind of mind-blowing it sort of it sort of changed the way I thought about everything and I thought this is a world I hadn't seen anything like it before I thought this is a world I want to be part of somehow yes I still didn't yeah. think I want to be the costume designer no, it's sure. just like I want to be involved in this world yes yeah sort of a bit later on um Derek Jarman enters your life so how, how did that happen how did you sort of become part of the Jarman family I left college, I, well, I studied theatre design at Central School of Art before it was Central St Martins. I made a foundation at St Martins when it was just St Martins and the Fashion School. And then I did theatre design at Central um, at the Holborn um, base for two years. And then at the end of my second year, I actually met Lindsay Kemp, right. who I'd admired from afar. I actually met him because yeah. I attended a dance class that he was giving. Yeah. And then just went up to him and said, you know, yeah. I'm your biggest fan, and <laughs> where were you? Do you want to see my work? And uh, I ended up leaving, I ended up not going back to college right. uh, for my final year, and actually working with him in that year, oh, fantastic. that first year. Fantastic. And straight after that, came back to London, because uh, that was in Italy, came oh, back to London, to okay. yeah. and worked with um, small theatre companies in Fringe Theatre right. yeah. for a couple of years. And back in the early 80s, when there was a huge amount of Arts Council funding yeah. and for sort of experimental, there were hundreds of, of small theatre companies, experimental theatre companies. And we used to show at the ICA, yeah. basically. And I invited Derek Jarman to see one of those shows. I mean, I 
seen Jubilee, the Tempest and Sebastian, and thought they were amazing. Yeah, yeah. And thought, oh, it might be nice to do a film, might be interesting to do a film. And I somehow got hold of Derek John's phone number, phoned him up, out of the blue. So you and just phoned him up? That was it, I didn't. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Come and see a show at the ICA, and he, and he which came. He came, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then before Geelong, you're making Caravaggio with him. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, it all yeah. seems remarkably easy. I don't know how. I was, just, I was really lucky. Um, but he came to see that, and then he actually said to me, well, the route to doing film is you should um, start with doing music videos, and that was sort of when music videos were really sort of starting up and getting big in the early, 80s, early uh, to mid-80s. And did you make some? And I did a year of music videos oh, did first, you? Yeah. yeah. And the first yes. one was with him. Oh, right, right, right. And he introduced me to producers. Actually, Tim Bevan, who is now right. working title, yeah. Work, yeah, working title, was then a, with another producer called Sarah Radcliffe, part of Aldabra, and we did. Yeah. I did about a year of music videos with them. But there you are, working with you know Tilda Swinton and Dexter Fletcher. Yeah, and then on, then, on then, then, then Caravaggio, yeah. yeah. And how did how did Derek Jarman work as a as a director? In retrospect, unlike any other director I've worked with, I mean, it was a fantastic experience, and it wasn't that far removed from when I was doing theatre. Yeah. It, uh, fringe theatre. Yeah. It was. It was. It felt like it was everybody doing a bit of everything. It, everybody was mucking in. I mean, on Caravaggio, like when the um, like the scenic artist finished doing that, they came and helped in the costumes. Right. I mean, I was making costumes. My assistant was making costumes. We were just all sat around making costumes. Yeah. I didn't know that we had to have actually somebody on set doing standby till about week three, <laughs> when the continuity woman came in and said, "Do you think someone could come and have a look at this hat? I don't think it's on right." <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what we were meant to do, but it was sort of, it felt very organic, and I'm sure it wasn't, I'm sure Derek was incredibly organised, but I mean, I think what was interesting about him was that he really, he was really excited by young people, and I realised that on that film, I mean, the average age was 25, Gosh. people working on film, and okay, yeah. Christopher Hobbs, the production designer, was a bit older, was yeah. Derek's age, I mean, Derek was probably in his 30s then. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. It was actually a very, very young crew. Yeah. And we sort of muddled through. But somehow he sort of he pulls all the jigsaw puzzle pieces together. Yeah. As a, I mean, as he was incredibly whole. inspiring and obviously very visual because he was a, he started out as a painter. Yes. And a, a and, designer. And theatre. So he was very good at communicating all of that and would give you all this information, but then leave you to get on with it. Right. And do yeah, it. Yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of it was made up on the day. It yeah, was all yeah, sort of yeah. cobbled together. He would kind of ask anybody their opinion. He'd ask there'd be some sort of some runner sweeping the yeah. stage and he'd, he'd say, what do you think of this? How about, about you know, and yeah. it was, it was it kind of truly sense. collaborative. Yeah, yes, yeah, very sort of democratic Experience. approach to yeah. kind of filmmaking. Edward II, um, which sort of comes sort of, sort of next, I mean, um, incredibly brave production because Jarman sort of fuses a, a 1590s play with a, with a sort of a struggle against, you know, kind of very intense homophobia in the public domain in, in, mm -hmm. the, early, in the early 90s. But it's completely brilliantly realised. The set appears to be sort of kind of, it's a dirt floor mm. and kind of blocks of grey. They were just walls, these huge Wall, big walls. walls that moved. Yeah. So the walls would like yeah. come together to make a corridor or get bigger and that's all it was. It was yes. brilliant. Um, so... Uh, our attention, I think, definitely is kind of brought to costume. They they create all those characters instantly. Yeah, it was a sort of bit of an empty, a sort of blank, a canvas, a blank yeah, canvas, to like a blank canvas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you have sort of more resources at that point, or? He took a budget. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> more people to I help. I probably or... did. Yeah, I definitely had a bigger budget. It probably was absolutely minute. Right. Gosh. Because the people who, the person who made mm. all of. Tilda's costumes was a sort of young mm. person I'd just met who's called John Krause, who's now a designer. But I, I didn't know him and he was just really good at making costumes. I mean, everyone, I mean, we pretty much all worked for nothing. I mean, really, Did you? very right. little. Yeah. Really, gosh. I'd gosh. have been making things as well. Really. Yeah. It was strange. Back then, you didn't even think about the money. You had some money and you thought, okay, well, we'll do it out of that somehow. And you beg, borrow, and steal. I mean, you sort of somehow got it together. Mm. There probably was a little bit more than Caravaggio. Well, it was a huge, I mean, it was a huge success. And I seem to remember, um, I've got a figure in my head, the entire budget for Caravaggio was less than half a million, I think. Edward, um, Edward II was, you know, kind of very, very in, in, important, um, I think, in, for that sort of gay struggle as, as well at that mm. particular time. But I think Tilda Swinton really does stand out 
uh, you know, she, you know, she's still yeah, Swinton. Yeah, still Swinton. <laughs> um, but you know, but the, you know, the way that she is is dressed, you know, she looks like a million dollars. That's mm. extraordinary that you've done that on beg, beg stealing and borrowing. Yeah, uh, quite quite incredible. Clever costume maker. Oh. <laughs> um, for um, <clears throat> Lichtenstein. Now this mm. this is done against really against a black set. I mean, there's there's no set. There's there's props and things. But it has a very, very strong, very strong colour palette. And I, did that come from Derek? It did, Derek, that yeah. That colour palette? Yes, it did. It was, it, yeah, I think that actually came from him, the same costume, but in all these different colours. Yeah. And I think some of the colours were specific, like there, there were lavenders and greens that were specifically yeah. his choice. Um, I, mean, I think we'll, we'll come to this a bit later. I think, I think colour is hugely important to you. Mm -hmm. It is. <laughs> and uh, having, having spent... Uh, the last couple of weeks, um, kind of going through your back catalogue, indeed, various DVDs and things, um, I, I, I begin to see shades. Our favourite shades, <laughs> I, do, I you? do indeed, yes, oh. yeah. There's definitely some greens. There's uh, always a green. <laughs> which that's, is, that's which one is of the green. colours I have the most arguments about. Ah, yeah. Greens, yeah, especially when there's green screens involved. Yes, yeah. And blues and blue screens, and yes. then arguing whether something was a green or a blue. Can we talk a bit about uh, basically your working process and how you how you work as a designer? Um, you well, I guess it begins with a written word or with a, a script or with a conversation with a director, or maybe they go hand in hand. Hand in hand. I mean, sometimes the director you, you talk to the director first, but then the first thing I want to do is read the script. I mean, if someone's asking me to do something, even if it's a director I know well, no, if it's a director I know well, I'll say yes, even if I haven't read the script. <coughs> if I, you know. If it's someone I want to work with, I know they've got a good script. But usually, yes, it's if someone I don't know, then yeah, absolutely, the script is the first thing, and then followed by a meeting with the director, and to hear their vision and hear what their take on it is and and what they're trying to achieve. And then the research begins, and this is kind of what I mentioned at the very beginning, because um, Gangs of New York, which was featured in the Hollywood Costume Exhibition, mm. and I remember you bringing in, as I mentioned. Um, your research, which was about, I think, about seven or eight um, folders, absolutely packed with uh, photographs, images of the period, but it was much wider than that. Yeah. And I, I thought that was really, really interesting, that it wasn't just the period where the script is set. It was much, much wider, much, much wider. Yeah. And I thought that was great. And we scanned all that and had that in that moving montage with yourself and Martin discussing that. But do you do that for every every project? It's about sort of gathering visual Pretty much, images. yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, you st obviously, you st if it's a period, which generally it is, you start with the actual period and get every piece of information that you can for that period, whether it's photographs and if it's pre-photography, paintings and images, and, and also written written material. And then after that, go go wider, go into either different periods or very often contemporary fashion. I mean, it's not just me. I think a lot of designers do the same thing. You look, you look everywhere. Might look at paintings that are abstract, but there might be interesting colour combinations and ideas. Um, uh, but then look at all periods and all images and uh, in terms of character. I don't think of characters necessarily in that period costume. I think of characters. I mean, I seem to remember I had pictures of Keith Richards for Daniel. I mean, there's a book that actually Derek introduced me to on Caravaggio um, by a photographer called Kudelka, and it's a book of gypsy, photographs of gypsies from Czechoslovakia at the time, in the 60s and 70s. Um, I still use that book right. on whatever film I'm doing. Gosh. I still refer to that book because Gosh. there are faces and characters in that book that I can always use. And I've got, there's one favourite photograph I've got from that book that he, this, this guy just comes up usually on every mood board, whatever I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> so there are things like, you know, there yeah. are things like that. Yes. So you just, it, yeah. it's a, you're thinking of, it, yeah. it's like the feeling. I mean, you might, you might look at a photograph of somebody or a painting of somebody and you like the feeling, you like the essence of them and then translate that into whatever period it is. And maybe it's the way that somebody's standing or the way that somebody, something is being worn or maybe it's a, a combination of things, a colour combination. And um, casting, so central, because casting can change sometimes at the last minute. Yeah. So do you usually know um, 
for, say, gangs in New York, who was in those principal on positions? The, so you're, are you thinking of them in your, in your head when you're thinking of the, the character? On the bigger projects, on the bigger budget the, projects, yeah, there's yes, always yeah. a star attached. There's always names attached, so you know who that is, which is helpful. Yeah. Because you then read the script with that person in mind. I mean, but on many other <clears throat> lower budget things, you, you might read the script before there's any cast and you read it. And it, it's actually why I don't even begin to think about designing a costume to learn that he's wearing it, on right. the whole, if right. I can. Right. Yeah. Because you can have, even build up your own idea of what that character should look like and have an idea for it, and then you can design a costume, and then you get the actor, you go, oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> you, know? yeah. you, you, yes. you might be yeah. imagining yeah. physically somebody who yeah. is not going to be the person that walks in the room. Yes. Yeah. So it's really yeah. important to know yeah. exactly. I mean, quite often I wish I was doing the casting. You know, you want to be doing, you want to be doing the because you actually read it. I know who this should be. Yeah. And then it's really disappointing when it's, when it's not. Or, <laughs> yeah, or it's someone not. totally different. But <laughs> equally, that's a challenge. You go, know, okay, I've now got to, you know, not think about all of that stuff I was thinking about and rethink it for this person in this body. Yeah. And um, at that stage, are you talking to the production designer, cinematographer? to create the world that you're kind of creating? Does that begin, obviously, at the very, very beginning? It does. Um, I mean, there's not so much you can do at the very, very beginning. I mean, yes, you, you sort of have a general meeting at the beginning, but then you, you aim to, the aim is to, to keep in touch with all of those people and have a look at all the images they're using and, and looking at. And um, so it's just, you know, you don't design for a particular setting or for a, you know, a particular colour of an armchair, but it's good to sort of know in the back of your mind what the environment is or what the setting is. And I, I sort of assume that quite often, perhaps a director, depending on who it is, and we're going to come to different directors, have a particular vision of the world that they're recreating. Or does that sometimes come, come from the designers, perhaps? Or two-way, a two-way kind of it conversation? It depends, it's all different. I mean, yeah. Sometimes you get some directors who know exactly what they want down yeah. to every tiny little detail. And then you get other directors who will leave it to their designers to yeah. sort of you know, give them ideas or to sort of produce things. Yes, yeah. Different directors concentrate on different things. I mean, you get some directors who are really visual. I mean, like, you know, Derek Jarman, Tartain's, Martin Scorsese are all very visual and talk in terms of visuals. But yes. then you get other directors yeah. who are less visual. I mean, not. I mean, they're visual, obviously, because they're making films, but not in the same way. They might not understand the design process in the same way. They might be writers, for instance. Yes, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it kind of works in different ways. I mean... Sometimes you have to feed the director lots of things before they can actually understand what it is they want. Sometimes they don't know what they want until they're shown it. Right. And other, other people can be really quite specific about it. Yeah. It's about getting, it's about getting to um, understand the way somebody works really, really quickly. If you haven't worked with them before, you've got to really tune into people very, very quickly, which is why it's a real benefit. And try and find to work with somebody, to actually work with somebody you've worked with before. It makes yeah. it a lot easier. Yeah. And then you're assembling, I imagine you're assembling your, your, your team, um, sort of your makers, your, your cutters. Do you work with the same people? Or in an ideal world. In an ideal world. In an ideal world, you work with your, you know, you, obviously, again, the same thing. If you're working with people you've worked with for years, it's so much easier. But it doesn't always work like that. It's really difficult. You yeah. know? I, mean, yes. yeah. I mean, if I do a, a, a job in the UK and I've got my fabulous UK team, yeah. but then I hop over to America to do a job there, my team then have to keep working and they go and work with another designer. And if I come back, I might have lost them. Right. You know, they, yeah. they yes. might stay with that other designer or they might do another job. And yeah. You get yeah. you literally get out of sync. Yes. Yeah. So yes. it's really yeah. it's yeah. really difficult to yeah. keep hold of the same people. Yeah. But, yeah. You know. well, but, then, but then again, you meet new people and it's always, yeah. yes. you know, it's always good. In terms of period... Um, this is sort of an off the cuff question, really. What would be more cha what's, what was more challenging, the end the end of the uh, of the affair, forties, or a contemporary film? Such contemporary as for me, the contemporary is harder. Right, contemporary is harder. Which is why I don't do it so much. Not because ah, it's hard. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I do very few contemporary films. Um, why is that? <laughs> Number one, because everybody has an opinion. Okay. Whereas if you do period, 
a lot of people don't know so much of that. I mean, obviously, it. Yes. you're the person that knows more. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I actually find it more interesting. Yeah. I actually do yes. find it more interesting doing yeah. period. And, yeah. and generally, you, you get to make a lot more than you do in, you know, contemporaries, a lot of shopping. Okay, yes. Um, yeah. I mean, but it, yeah. of course it's interesting. And of course, and I, I actually think there are certain people who are really, really good at contemporary and making it look real. I think it's really difficult to make contemporary look real. Yes. Because I think what often happens is if it's not done well, is it just looks like someone's been to the shops and put brand new clothes on. Yeah. And it doesn't look like real <coughs> lived in clothing. That, that's it, isn't it? It's yeah. that sort of and quite often, period can be easier than that. Because for half of the film, you know, you've rented a lot of stuff that actually is from the period, so it's very worn in. <laughs> you know, and it, it looks worn and it looks... You know. Yeah, and you don't have to do a lot of extra work or make it I mean, like... you know, personally, I prefer to do period than contemporary. Okay. But that was one I couldn't say no to. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that very topic of projects such as uh, Young Victoria, The Favourite, The Other Berlin Girl, there's something about, I think, you say a bit more about the sil silhouette structure. I think people are, ask me, I don't know why they're ask, asking me, what are the actors wearing underneath? <laughs> okay. Does it begin from the inside out? Of course. Well, everything does, whatever period it is, actually. Yeah. You know, yeah. even now. Yeah. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah, even yeah. now. I mean, yeah. somebody's yeah. bra shape now is different from somebody's bra shape 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And that gives yes. the, you know, the silhouette, the yeah. shape. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course it starts from the yeah. inside out, for women particularly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course it's yeah. um, crinolines or panniers or whatever, yeah. yes. petticoats, yeah. bustles, bum pads, hip pads. Yeah. All of it, that, that's where you have to start. Yeah. And you can't do it without. No. And there's been a lot of talk about, you know, mm. women shouldn't be made to wear corsets now. You know, I mean, it was recently. Oh, really? really? I mean, when, oh. when the posters for Cinderella came out, there was a big kerfuffle about oh, how right, right. small Lily James' waist was. Okay. And they said it had been CGI, it had been, and it hadn't been. It actually was that small, and therefore, okay, it was the fault of the corset, which has been, mm. you know, inhumanely strapped in. Inhumanely into strapped in. <laughs> But what people don't know is that if the corset is made properly and well and yeah, fits, yes. it's not yeah. painful. It's not. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know. And, and would you have would you have to commission that a, a, a corset that goes with, say, the Young Victoria or the Favorite or? Well, the, that's where you start with your actor. The yeah, first thing you, yeah. you, you do is yeah. you, you make the underwear yeah. stuff. You get the corset that yeah. fits. You get the underwear that's yeah. right, and then the dresses just pop on top yeah. and look right. And they would look great. Right. I, I, I was sense that for the actor that must be fantastic because you just simply hold yourself in a completely actually different way. <laughs> <laughs> but it does help the posture because there are so many young actors who, you know, are used to wearing, you know, modern clothes, track pants, slouching around. Most people have bad posture and you put a corset on it, it gives you good posture. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, it, you know, it, it, and some people appreciate that and other people don't. Um, but it, it, you know, I think it, it, might, it should enable the person to become the person that they're yeah. that they're betraying because it's kind of, yeah, yeah well, you know, without the costume, then you know, what can they do? So um, I think that's so kind of essential. At one point, she's she's wearing quite masculine. Did you deliberately put in quite masculine? I did a sort of masculine look at I me. Mean, not not every I mean, she wears dresses as well, but yes. there was a sort of masculine feel because she was the one that was. You know, in control. I mean, she she ultimately is the one that's in control of everything. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So I wanted to yeah. convey that a little yeah. bit without putting her in, you know, drag. Yeah. And I also read that um, you sourced the material in Brixton, or a lot, a lot of the no, materials. No, a lot of the well, um, for the for the court scenes, which were all monochrome, black and white. Yeah. It was just all cotton, and most of it was African print, just oh, plain black and right. plain white cottons. Right. Right. So fairly cheap because yeah. we didn't have a big budget for this at all so didn't I had to find you? a yeah. way of doing yeah. of, of making costumes that would work for court I mean there's, there's no embroidery there's no embellishment there's no jewels there's no anything I had to sort of dispense with all of that yeah. I thought, okay I've got to simplify this and stylize it yeah 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 and then by making it monochrome it meant I didn't have to spend money dying things and finding <laughs> different color fabric and it just narrowed it down to make it yes yeah, yeah. manageable that came from one of the visual references that Yorgos gave me was um, an image from a Bergman film, Cries and Whispers, Cries and Whispers, where everybody was in white in a red room and he didn't know, he just said he liked the idea of white 
somewhere. He didn't, he didn't know when or where or why, but it, it was just he liked this idea of white. And then that gave me the idea of, well, yeah, that'd be great, everybody in white, to maybe just make the whole of the court scene monochrome, so there's a lot yeah. of white. Yes, yeah. And we were also shooting in completely natural light. Oh. There was no lighting in that film at all. There was no Apart lighting. Apart from some exterior night scenes, there was a Gosh. little bit of light. But everything, all the interiors were natural light. Natural so I knew there'd be a lot of dark and shade. Yeah, yes, yeah. And it'd be, I'd like the idea of either black or white appearing out of dark. Right, right. Shakespeare in Love, there are very, very little um, depictions of William Shakespeare in on film or TV and, until until this moment. And there's something about, obviously, Joseph Fine's performance, the script, but your costume, that completely reinvigorates William Shakespeare into this kind of like flesh and blood person, like a sort of energetic man of action. And I think he completely revitalised that image of Shakespeare. I think it's all down to you. Really? It's to do with that jacket he wears that Joe finds worse. Yeah, yeah, the leather I, I, jacket. I really, I really, I really do. Yeah. And the undone leather jacket. Yeah, the whole know, point was, it was, it's and how it's worn as well. It was like yeah. undone. It was like the same old leather jacket you put on every day. Yeah, yes, yeah. Cause, cause he, he really just wears that for the whole, yes. the whole, the yeah. whole film. Yeah, it doesn't change. But, I mean, I thought that was really hugely successful in terms of, you know, to taking that character. What, what was sort of your inspiration? I think it was about making him a normal bloke. Yeah, that, yes. that was the whole point. Right. Was yeah. it wasn't, yeah, yeah, he wasn't yeah. elevated. It wasn't on some it wasn't pedestal. Kind of on a it was pedestal. Kind of like, this is a normal bloke trying yeah. to write. Yes. Yeah. And, but that's you know, you... and, and yeah. obviously the idea was he was like quite cool and you know. Yeah. Yeah. Because she falls for yeah. him and all the rest of yes. it. So yeah. Yeah. Normal bloke in a leather jacket. There's um, uh, some interesting things that you you sort of said about the kind of the huge difference between. Um, the, the world of the, the rough and ready theatre, mm -hmm. I think I think probably colour palette, and then... And the theatre goers as well. Yes, yeah, 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 which comes across so kind of incredibly strongly, all kind of quite sort of earthy and lived in, and are those things made or sourced, found, sourced, or... All of the principles were made, everything, yeah, yeah all yeah. of the principles were made and all of the theatre costumes were made, this was all made, yeah. yeah. Hell of a lot of them. All the yeah. crowd were rented. Right, all rented. Yeah, all the crowd were rented. Yeah, and where would you go for? for well, that? in London, Angels and Cosprop, and then we go to Italy to the costume houses Torelli and Peruzzi in Italy. Okay. Probably Spain as well, Cornetta in Spain. You, you literally scour yeah. all of the European costume houses. Gosh, really? Yeah. And then the kind of the world of the of the you know the kind of the court. And in fact, uh, two of these. I can tell you, it's half of these are Italian costumes. Oh, I mean, the really? the, the yeah, extras, yeah. I mean, obviously she's made. She's made. All made from scratch. Yeah. 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 Principles are all made. Oh yeah, yeah. But that, I think that, that contrast of those worlds really comes across so so incredibly yeah, strongly. Yeah, the happiness of the in of Shakespeare the, in love. The, yeah. yeah, it lives like a. But it, but it feels like a, a, a lived-in world, which I think is, yeah, one of. Again, yeah. that was the point of it, really, because yeah. it was about real people in the real world. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Apart from the Queen. Yeah. During the nineties, you have an incredibly important collaboration with Neil Jordan. Mm. And, you know, these are just some of the, you know, I think, enduring classics. So, Interview with a Vampire, was that sort of like a first major Hollywood film? Yeah, that was my first for big, for, yeah, big I guess Hollywood it was film. Because the, the first film I did with Neil was not The Crying Game, it was a film called The Miracle, which was oh, the miracle. a film that we shot yeah. in Ireland. Yeah. And then The Crying Game was in about 91. Yeah. Yes. 1991. Yeah. Which, funny enough, that was a contemporary film at the time, and I look at it now and it looks like a period film. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> we, watched it, we watched it a few years ago for the 25th anniversary, mm -hmm. and I looked at it and thought, oh, this looks really good. For it. And I, I looked at it, I watched it thinking someone had done it, and it's a period, oh, the period's really good, and I thought, oh, I forgot it was a contemporary film. <laughs> and it looks really old fashioned now. I mean, the film still stands out. Absolutely, it looks, yeah, yeah. It looks no. like a period film. Yes, well. yes, yeah. Um, but for 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 interview, did you sort of um, did you get sort of a much bigger budget? You're sort of working with like Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt and Christian Slater, and where more res res was a Hollywood resources put in? It was it was or, a much bigger budget. Unfortunately, yeah. I had a different assistant for that job who I'd never worked with before, but had previously worked with um, Jim Atchison, actually, who was a bit older than me, who'd done. Oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. 
and he showed me the ropes. I mean, I don't think I could Didn't have done it. I don't think like I could that. have done it without uh, an assistant who'd done this scale of film before. I right. Okay. Seen. Okay. I mean, I probably would have. Yeah. You know, muddled through, but I mean, it really helped to have somebody who'd done something on that scale before and could take care of the budget. I didn't have to think. I didn't have to worry. You didn't have to. That. Yes. Yeah. 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 It but was a whole different, yeah, ball game, and also having somebody like Tom Cruise. Yeah, I guess it comes with extra pressure because it's yeah, Tom Cruise. It, or I think it felt like everybody was a little bit nervous. You know, it was, it was okay. suddenly a sort of it wasn't quite so much everybody mucking in and mucking around. Okay, it suddenly bit. became a bit more grown up. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Todd Haynes. And then going back to having mucking around and having fun. This was really low budget, and this was a real scramble to get together. This was fake borrow steel. Did Todd Haynes uh, approach you, or did you phone him up like did with Derek John? <laughs> I did, um, no, I did track down Todd Haynes. I knew, I knew that there was a film being made about glam rock. Oh, right. Gonna be made. And but I you'd knew, heard that on the great First of all, I got it wrong. First of all, I heard there was going to be a Mark Boland film. Oh, okay, okay, yes. And then it was like, no, yeah. there's going to be... Um, yeah. And I knew that someone called Todd Haynes was doing it, but then, coincidentally, and rather luckily, it transpired he was good friends with Elizabeth Carson and Stephen Woolley, who are producers that I'd already worked with throughout all the Neil Jordan films. Yes, uh, okay. And so okay. we got to meet. Yes, yeah. And I said, I yeah. need to do this one. I mean, just re-watching this um, recently, and um, what what's really struck me is the, the, the people. I think we talked about this, didn't we, slightly, about sometimes depictions of the 70s, it just looks too glossy and polished and designed and it didn't doesn't really you really capture the people of those 70s people you 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 really do um you know in these kinds of moments the kids, where, the the kids people, yeah, yeah 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 i mean park inside the kind of the flamboyant yeah you know the david bowie sort of esque um but you really do that was that was it all sourced from i mean filmed in london i assume it was all filmed in all london, london yeah um, and it was all, yes, it was all sourced. It was either rented or just shopped. I mean, I did a lot of the shopping myself, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, Portobello, all the flea markets, everything. And that was, I mean, now, I mean, that was, what, 25 years ago? Yes. Again, 25 yeah. years ago. Yeah. You could still get 70s things right. in the markets now. You can't for love and money. They're now sort of like valuable antiques. Yes. You know, 70s <laughs> now. Now yeah, yeah. Portobello is full of 90s. <laughs> Yeah, gosh. But this was yeah. in the 90s, getting 70s, yeah. so it was, yeah. you know, it's incredible yeah. how, you know, things move on. But, you know, just shopped and shopped and found it all. Yeah, um, yes. But I agree, quite often the 70s looks like fancy dress. It, 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 quite often the 70s films look like, you know, what you wear if you're going to a 70s fancy dress party, yes. like yeah, the yeah. most extreme yeah. and the silliest. And yeah, and it's too polished. Yeah, but and I, I mean, the thing is, the, 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 the kind of concert goes, the kids, I mean, I remember being, you know, a teenager that I remember being 14, 15 and, and having my flare and having trousers before they were flares and sewing the triangles in the side. Right, yeah, yeah. And actually customising my own clothes and wanting to have all of that. And that's what I, I really wanted to get that homemade look, you know. Well, because I, I mean, no, you know, yeah, if you're 14, yeah. you couldn't afford to go and buy clothes then. No, no, you know, no, no, there no, wasn't no. the fry marks or the top no, shop. There, no. there, well, there was top shop, but it wasn't like, yeah. it, it wasn't as cheap, the clothes weren't as disposable and as, yeah. as ready, yeah. readily available as they are now, so you had to make do yeah. and, and customise and make your own things, and yeah. that's kind yeah. of what I wanted to yeah. show with that. Well, re-watch Velvet Goldman, because it is fantastic, and this really comes, I think, across very, very strongly, the sense that you were there in these various markets, yeah. wherever you were, kind of, but it, it feels authentic, and that's what, you know, I think that comes across incredibly strongly. Um, Far, far from heaven, um, again, colour color palette mm. is just absolutely st stunning. It's so beautifully, you know, each frame is like a, it's, well, it's a work of art. Um, like an image like this, I mean, again, was that, was that sort of Todd, or, or were you was, given freedom to say, well, right, so... No, I have to say, the colour was incredibly important, because, of course, it was based on... The, the Douglas, Douglas Cirque films, films, all the heads and the lines. And they're, they're, they've yeah. all got very specific yeah. colour. There's very, very strong and specific colour yeah. palettes. Yeah. So we watched yeah. all of those. Yeah. But what Todd actually did was we had scripts. And we, myself, Todd, Ed Lackman, the cinematographer, 
and Mark Freeberg, the um, production designer, we had days and days and days of meetings, sort of going through Douglas Circle, breaking it down, and actually going through the script, breaking it down. And what Todd did, at the beginning of every scene, he had like Pantone colour. He actually had in his mind an idea for the colour palette of each scene, and that's all. And just had, and he, he wasn't specifically like this is the wall, this is the dress, this is the you know sofa. It was just this is just his feeling for the colours. So we all went away with those, and then we did what we wanted. But um, I don't know. I don't remember. I didn't know. I know we were shooting in fall, and we had to shoot in fall. And, and strangely, this actually. We made this film just after 9-11. I mean, I was actually prepping this film when 9-11 happened in New York, but I'd literally flown to L.A. the day day before it happened. And I got stuck in L.A. because I couldn't get back to New York for two weeks because they closed all the airports down. And we didn't even know whether the film would go ahead. And incredibly, the film still went ahead. Yes, yes. And we shot all in New Jersey. And they were desperate that we shot in time, because if we hadn't have shot in time, if it had been delayed any further, we'd have missed that. We'd have missed those, of course. the autumn. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the yeah. autumn colours. Yes. And he was desperate to get the autumn colours. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we wouldn't have had that scene. No, 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 no. But I don't recall doing those clothes to go with the autumn colours. I, I didn't, hadn't really okay. computed that, but yes. I, we did have his colour palettes to, to go by. Yeah. And everything made? Everything made for this, or sort found, or bit of both. Fun. Bit of both. Yeah. I mean, Julianne's were all made. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yes. She and she was actually pregnant, which was a real which problem. brings me very beautifully on to, which is I'm going to quote, well, not quote, but um, Edith Head, one of the, one of the great Hollywood costume designers, <laughs> often wrote. She sort of said, "Well, sometimes as designers, we have to uh, have visual." tricks to kind of dis maybe distract the audience's eye on something. So Julianne was, was, was pregnant yeah. during the making of the film. So that must have been logistically challenging. Well, it was. We've no, we, we just started at the very beginning. She said, oh, I just have to let you know I'm pregnant. I'm three months pregnant, but don't worry. Um, I, I didn't show for ages with her first child. And of course, with the second child, it's different. Apparently, you show much quicker. Your body just pings back in. <laughs> so she's and she's wearing these dresses. You know, she started out with at three months. She still had a tiny waist, and I had her in girdles and things yes. like that. Yeah. yeah, And then it just started yeah. expanding, expanding, expanding. And we had all these exterior scenes with coats and things, but unfortunately, we shot the other way round. Right. We started right. with the exteriors. Okay. With the, the big coats, the yeah. big swing coats, and everything, because <laughs> to get the floor. <laughs> and then we went into the studio so, yes. and did all the things without the coats. By which time her belt was on the very last little thing there, and I was getting the dress out now and now. Gosh, gosh. So she did a lot of walking, a lot of holding things. Yes. But I, get, I mean, no, but you do. You, you, you I can know, see it when I watch I, the film. I can see. I yeah, can I mean, see I, I know that. So when I'm watching it, I'm sort of thinking, yeah. "Gosh, Sandy was a you were a magician." To, to do that visual trick, that sort of Edith Head approach of I mean, like, it's just, yeah, we, we, it's, not, it's not drawn to what we, What we would do now with a bigger budget is have more than one dress, but we couldn't have yeah. that. And cheat yeah. it to make it look like the waist, to make the bit, this bit bigger, to make that bit yeah. look smaller and shadier yeah. and all that yeah. shit, but yeah. we just had the one dress. <laughs> the one dress, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Magnificent um, Carol, um, which is probably one of my you know, favourite films mm -hmm. of yours, um, um, we've got some sort of sketches. I, I see. I, I I jumped the sketching question actually. As we're here, um, do you do you often do you sketch for the director, producer, actor, or no, not so much, or mm, in, in, the, in the in the in the pro, in the process? No, I, the reason I don't is because I actually don't know what it's going to look like till I start making or until right. I start in a fitting. So yeah, yeah. I will I will do a draw if I'm making something. I'll do a drawing for my cutter, my maker, if I'm trying to work something out or, or discuss a proportion, yeah. and that will be a drawing that only they will understand or I will understand. It wouldn't be anything that a director would understand. Okay. And I feel I can't, I would, I would waste too much time trying to do a beautiful drawing of something, getting the colour exactly right. I'd never yeah. get the colour yeah, yeah. right. Yes. And then what actually happens is once you start making the costume and in the fitting, it change, It all changes anyway. It could completely change and turn into something else, and I don't want to sort of, you know, destroy someone's expectations saying this is what it's going to look like because it's not this is a draw this is a piece of paper and a drawing yes yeah 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 i'd rather yeah, yeah, show yeah. you something in 3d yeah. i'd rather show you a fitting when yeah. i'm happy with yes. it yeah 
and then it can yeah. be changed after that. So these will come up. These will come at the end when I know what it looks like. Right. These, these are just illustrations. <laughs> yeah. So is that? I mean, maybe it's a trade secret in the film. But is that kind of fairly common to design a sketch, or not so? To, depends. No, on I think everybody works differently. Yeah. I know a lot of designers who do who start with a sketch. Right. right? That's how they work things out. Yeah. They start with a sketch, and that's what they show somebody else. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not half. Have I done that? I mean, sometimes I do because maybe that's the only way you sort of say, "Well, it's going to be this sort of shape," okay? yeah, but it's yes. not going to, but it's yeah. not going to look exactly like this. Yeah, yes. It could change. Yes, yeah. And it's, I know you have to, you have to hope that people trust that. You yeah. know, you'll get there in the end, and yeah. don't worry, and it can still yeah. change. But yes, yes. I just don't yes. think I'm, I'm good enough at drawing to actually show exactly what it's going to be like. And it's also, it's an organic process. It is going yeah. to change. Yes, yeah, yeah. Now the the um the, the time period for for Carol was, I think it's something like 1952, but you made a very good point about it's not a 50s film. No. It's actually a, a sort of late 40s well, film. Well, it looks like you, you, know, yeah. you use clothes from the 40s to yeah. do 1952, yes. because yeah. not everybody yeah. goes out and buys a new outfit every year. And, and actually the 50s don't really look like the 50s till about after 55. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that's a really yeah important yeah, kind of point, really, that yeah, the decades get defined... Uh, the fashion of a decade gets defined, mm. but you're right, it doesn't really begin until the middle of the decade. Mm. And also there'll so, be a hell of a load of people in Carol who will be wearing clothes from the 1930s, like older right, characters right, and older yeah, people yeah, will be wearing yeah, clothes that yes, are yeah, 10 yeah, years old, yes, 10, 15 years yeah, old. Yes. Was that shot in uh, uh, New York? Cincinnati. Or? Cincinnati? Yeah, it was shot in Cincinnati for New York. Yeah. Oh, right, right. It's too expensive to shoot in New York. Oh, really? So it has to Cincinnati. So Cincinnati is a really good, good yeah. place to go for New York, so it's yeah. still got... Lots of um, you know, unspoiled. Yes. Areas. Yeah. 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 Um, your, I mean, your your collaboration with you know Martin Scorsese is you know made, made seven films together. Um, it's been a fantastic partnership. Um, I have to ask, how did again? How did you meet? Did he approach you, or did you? Yeah, I got um, I got a call. I think it was after. I'd won for Shakespeare in Love. Okay. I think it was later that year. Yeah, yeah. I got a call saying that Martin Scorsese was coming to Europe, coming to Italy to oh, make okay. a film. Yeah. And was interested in meeting me. Yeah. Or was interested in, did yeah. I want to read the script? Yeah. And I read the script and it was that. It was impenetrable actually. It took about a week to read it. Was, <laughs> was it Gangs of New York? Yeah, Gangs of New York. Okay, okay. And then I flew to New York to meet him. Okay, yeah. And was there something about. Did he say, I saw I saw this and I loved it? No, I don't remember what he said, actually, no. But when you sort of get to the um, the, the, the aviator, again, I suppose it's a, a kind of a, a process you're dealing with, you know, uh, Howard Hughes, Catherine Hepburn. Did you, you know, look at the photographs, look at Hepburn films? Yeah, of course, looked at everything. Looked at yeah, every image yeah. there was of the pair of them and her yeah, films and yeah, everything. Yeah. And then there were certain costumes that, for... for Leo as, as Howard, that we tried to replicate exactly like there's some, some famous ones, jacket, gabardine jacket with the check sleeves and the hat, and then the actual aviator look. Um, I mean, he wore off the. I mean, he wore like crappy clothes. I mean, he wore off the peg like yeah. cheap clothes and yeah. and um, kegs shoes, you know, pinsoles right. practically. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But then you know, so there's some a couple I tried to replicate, and others. Yeah. Then you then you just sort of did clothes in the style of, and the same with Hepburn. Um, I don't think there was anything that I actually copied exactly, but just sort of did it within, you know, the essence of Catherine Hepburn. Yes, yeah, yeah. And then a project, again, this is Wolf of Wall Street, mm -hmm. 80s, New York, yuppie 80s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a, a period film. It, it, it is, yeah, it yeah, is, and yes, even, yes. It but is, yeah. still kind of near, again, piecing that together Getting the right ties. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I, I realised how difficult it was doing doing recent yeah, history. The yeah, 90s, yes, yeah. especially when it hits the nineties, it's actually quite difficult. Right, right. To find certain things, yeah, it's, it's yes. quite difficult to actually see it. I mean, it feels to me, but maybe not so much now. But looking at recent history, it's really difficult to actually look at recent history and, and sum it up. It's not, you know, you, you kind of we know that the forties has a look, the fifties has a sixties. Yeah, we can see yes, all that, yeah, but actually yeah. see. I mean, I don't know if someone if I was going to do like. What's it called? The noughties, like the early two thousands, yes. which is twenty years ago now. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. What does, that, what does that look I, like? I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, I would. I couldn't either. sum that up no. right now without yeah. looking at it. Yeah. 
If it said 2005, you think, you think well, what yeah. would that be? But, You'd, yeah. but a kind of 16-year-old would, would <laughs> look at the old-fashioned clothes from 2000 and would yeah. be able to see it, probably. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Still all in my wardrobe. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can source it all from yeah. there. <laughs> um, I mean, there's certain. I think there's certain also certain actors that seem to sort of come round again with with. I guess that happens in the film industry. But um, you know, talked about Kate Blanchett and uh, you know, DiCaprio, um, Tilda Swinton. Does it when you know they're attached? Does it sort of get easier? Of course, that, that yeah. Collaboration. Act, yeah, yeah, absolutely. If it's yeah. an actor you already yes. work with, it's so yeah. much easier. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. you know the important things about them. Yeah. You know the, you know the insecurities, <laughs> the foibles. You know, you know what works. You know how yeah. they are and how they respond. It really makes it so much easier. And you can have a sort of short, a shorthand, yeah. like with the director. Yeah. I, I guess. And hopefully they of, trust you as well. A, few, a couple of years ago, a really huge book about a hardback book about Edith Head came out. Hmm. And uh, you wrote the foreword, and there's just um, a comment that you made, and I wanted to ask you if that's okay. okay. Uh, in in the foreword, which you, and you talk about Edith Head, um, how she she never sort of advertised the fact that she could sew, but of course she could sew, and she could have seamstress and all of that because she didn't want to be asked by a member of the audience what can you sew. But hmm. your your um, your quote is um, about eighty percent of what a costume costume designer does is psychology. Only 20% of it is art. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about that. A huge part of your job is dealing with people yeah. and characters. Yeah. So you're dealing yeah. with your actor, you know, and then who is playing this other part. And then quite, so you've got to remind them that they are playing this character and they're not them, you know. <laughs> So it's lots of the problems come when you're dressing people. It's like, mm, it doesn't suit me, I don't like this. I'm like, no, it doesn't suit you. But, you know, you might not wear this, but this person might. And this person might wear something that doesn't fit them very well. Or whatever. And there's all of that sort of thing. But you've also got to very, very quickly get somebody to trust you. Really quickly. Yes. Yeah. So you've just got to find really clever ways of getting them to trust you. And actually, it's really clever ways of getting your own way. I mean, if you know what you want, you've got to... Be clever about it, and the same with directors. You know, you might have directors who you realise they feel like they need to, they want to feel like they've had the idea for something, even though you've had the idea. Okay. So, you, <laughs> so you're just going to be clever with the way you present things. Yes. If you've got, you have this one or this one or this one, but you can be clever in how you make them pick the one that you want them to pick. So <laughs> it's about really getting to know people and how to handle people, and you're also, you're also managing. A huge group of people in your department. Yes, yes. So you've, yeah. you've got to be able to do that. You've got to manage people and understand which combinations of people work well together. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of dealing with, with, people, with people and people characters management. and temperaments. The creative bit of it is what you do kind of like, you know, quickly in your spare time or on the way somewhere. Yes, you know I mean? it's yeah, um, yeah, yes. Um, so you, the last couple of years you've been working on really major um, Disney productions, mm -hmm. and um, that's what you're doing doing now. Um, so for some, a project like Cinderella, um, you know, the whole marketing is really built a, around shoe, the dress, mm. the colour. Is there, because it's Disney, is there just much more pressure on you to come up with something that has to be so globally recognised? I suppose there is, but I haven't actually felt the pressure. I haven't, I mean, I, I didn't start any of the Disney projects with someone sitting me down saying, right, you've got to do this. I think, it, I think maybe it was just understood. And maybe if I hadn't done something that they thought was suitable for their franchising and merchandising, which is ultimately what they're selling. They're yes. selling the dolls more than they're selling the film. Or the fancy dress costumes or the whatever. That's where they make their money. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't done it, I'm sure I'd have known about it. You know, it would have to have been either I'd have been fired or they would, you know, I'd have to have changed something. So, yeah, it is all about. I mean, but I, I kind of, you know, I'm not stupid. I kind of knew that I had to bear that in mind. Yes. That whatever I was doing would have to translate as, you know, it was going to be reproduced somehow. Yes. So that's all. So as soon as you enter that kind of project, you kind of know that that is going to be yeah. on, on the on the agenda. Yeah. Are there a lot more people to please? 
Or, or is it is it still the director has well, on a Disney production? Does the director will still have the final say? Then? No, I don't think the director does have the final say. Okay. Well, maybe it depends on who the who the director, uh, director yeah. is. Yeah. No, on the whole, no. Um, Disney will have the final say over something like that. I mean, the director have a big say if the director really, really, really pushed for something uh, that Disney. Were, I mean, I don't know if there was if there was a thing if Disney was saying to me they're not sure about that, but I really wanted it and the director wanted it. Maybe they would be able to help sway it. But ultimately, I think it is the big well for certain key things for things yeah. like the you know the Cinderella dress. I mean, yeah. I'm doing Snow White now. The Snow White dress and yeah. the Evil Queen. That's, Disney need yeah. to approve it. They have to approve it. Yeah. But there haven't been any problems. I mean, there haven't been any sort of don't you dare disapprove it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to flip through, and then of course you get Glorious Kate again, yeah. and um, this fantastic green. Now, I think I mentioned at the very beginning, having now watched quite a number of mm. it, you like you like green. I feel that you like green. I like all yeah. colours. I mean, the the greens do seem to crop up. Yeah. Especially baddie greens. Ah, baddie greens. Um, <laughs> No, that was yeah. quite funny actually on, on Mary Poppins return. Oh, there was um Yeah, let's go to that actually. Yeah, that, we might come yeah, up. yeah, yeah, yeah. We had um, to we had to do a little display. We had to do oh, a little yeah. display for Disney executives coming round with all of the costumes and bits of set and everything. <laughs> and we did a display of the family. Mm. Of the entire family. Yeah. And we had them all lined up <clears> in their costumes. And they only when I came in and saw them all lined up. And my assistant Charlotte said, You know, Everybody's wearing green. <laughs> Every single person in this <laughs> is wearing green. We, I mean, the whole sort of uh, sort of CGI kind of, as as you mentioned at the very beginning, blue, yeah. you know, blue screen, green screen, green screen, and and the whole development of technology in filmmaking, which you you have seen, you know, from Derek Jarman days. Wow, I mean, that's a huge. Yeah. Journey. Does it? Does that affect you um, in the post production side of the filmmaking I process? I haven't. Well. Or, it depends what it is. I mean, mostly what I've done is, you know, knowing that there's going to be a green screen, you know, a green, literally a green screen or a blue screen, then you have the conversation with the cinematographer about, well, no one's wearing green, are they? And that's always, which is always a intention. <laughs> yeah, most people are wearing green. Um, can we have a blue screen, please? And then, and yeah, then, yes. I use yeah. quite a lot of blue as well. I, I yes. use a lot of yeah. the colour that's somewhere between green and blue, okay, which yes. makes it really difficult for visual <laughs> effects because I either use a green, green screen or a blue screen. So and I'm always arguing. So if it's a blue screen, I'm going, no, this is green. If it's a green screen, I'm going, no, this is blue. Um, <laughs> and what happens at that stage? Uh, is there well, there has to be a compromise somewhere. Right, Obviously, okay. they've only got a blue or a green screen, so yes. I usually have to make yeah. an adjustment. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that person doesn't disappear. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. In this particular case, yeah. the costumes were all designed and made. We shot with these costumes. I had no idea what the animation was going to be like. Well, like, I, we did. I sort of asked the animators to show me the style of animation they were going to be using. They hadn't designed the whole thing, but they, they kind of started sort of doing, um, you know, tests of what the style yeah, of animation yes, was, yeah. which is what I based these painted costumes on. I wanted right. them to work with the animation and look like they were part of the animation as opposed to the yeah. regular costumes against it. Yeah, yeah. But other than that, it wasn't affected by that. The film I'm doing right now, I'm working much more closely with visual effects. Right. No, I'm designing costumes now mm. for some characters that will be CG. Seven characters. Well, I'm not allowed to say too much. <laughs> <laughs> they will be CG, but yeah. wearing real clothes. So the CG so, characters wearing real clothes. Yes. So I have to make the real clothes. Right. And then yes. those real clothes are yeah. scanned yeah. and put onto the CG. But that's all going to be done with it. We're scanning them now because I've made them. But how they're put on these characters and how they're worn is going to be up to the animators, up to the, the, the people who are doing those things. I have nothing to do with that, which I find really strange. I mean, yes, someone yes. else is going to decide how many buttons they've got done up, mm. whether they're messy, whether yes. their shirt's hanging out, yeah, yes. what happens. And yeah, normally yes. that's what we do, you know, yeah, yeah, with an yes. actor. Yeah. You know, we decide how things are worn, because how things are worn are just as important as what is being worn. And I find that, this is the first time I've done this, and I'm okay. finding that a bit weird. It's like, yes. what, they scan, that's it, they're nothing to do with me anymore. Yeah. And someone else is going to decide yes. yeah, yeah, how it yeah. all works. Yeah. But, you know, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Will the post-production take place in the UK or America? America. America. So... It'll have nothing, it'll have nothing to do with that. I wanted to ask you, um, you um, 
you produced or an executive producer on Wonderstruck and, and The Bower. Did you enjoy oh, yeah. pr producing? Producing. <laughs> I mean, all that means is creative producer. All that means is you get a bit of a say in what's, what's happening, which is nice. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, okay, Wonderstruck was um, a film directed by Todd Haynes based on a book by Brian Selznick. And Brian Selznick wrote Hugo Cabret. Oh, yes. Which Martin Scorsese yeah. made the film Hugo yes, from. Yes, yeah. He wrote yeah. the book. Yeah. And he then sold the rights to the book and someone else wrote the script. But he was around during filming and that's when we met and became friends. Um, and then he asked me to read his next book that was called Wonderstruck. That was a, he, a children's book writer who writes books that are sort of half illustration and half uh, written word and they're amazing. Um, and I read that and he said, I'm going to have a go at writing this script myself, the screenplay myself, um, which he did. And then as he was doing it, he was sending it to me to read. And I'm going, sort of just like, we just chatted, you know, like friends and yes. discussed, well, how about doing this? I don't know, make notes. Yeah. And then he finished it and he said, oh, well, I, you know, well, what am I going to do now? I need to find a director. <laughs> so I said, oh, should, I, should I send it to Todd? And I sent it to Todd. Basically, I just sent Todd the script and the book and he loved it. And then all of a sudden we were making it, which was really <laughs> fun. So I got the credit just for doing that, for making the introduction. Yeah, I mean, you sort of yeah, and made that connection yeah. and put the card at all. Do you think it's something that you might do in the future? Or I'd or like to. Mm. I mean, I'd like to, only because I've been doing this for so many years now, so long, that I kind of, you know, I kind of, oh, I do know a bit about it, what's going on. And, you know, it's about getting together. I mean, I like the idea of getting yeah, together the yeah. right combination of elements and people and, you know. Um... There was a, um, a moment a couple of years ago at the Oscars and the BAFTAs, and it became a real red carpet moment. Um, and it's, uh, for me, you were raising awareness of uh, Derek Jarman's incredible house in mm -hmm. Cottage in D Dungeness. Um, did, you, did you go to the uh, ceremony thinking, I'm gonna, this, is, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get yeah. everyone I know yeah, it wasn't a little All those thing. people I've helped win Oscars. We to... needed to raise money in order to purchase Derek Jarmer's yeah. cottage in Dungeness so that it wouldn't just disappear into obscurity and then to sort of keep it and maintain it and preserve his legacy along with, you know, yes. just the actual yeah. building and everything went yeah. into it. And so, uh, you know, there was a... The Art Fund set up this campaign in order to raise money and it, they did it in... There were loads of different ways and they had online, you know, donations and things like that. Didn't know what to wear and thought, I'm not going to spend any more money getting more clothes. I'm going to do something sustainable. And I had, this is literally a twirl for oh, some suits that were made for a couple of years oh, earlier. Fantastic. And it's a twirl that was yeah. made by my tailor. And I'm yeah. just going to wear a twirl. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to do. And that was it, it was going to stop at that. And then I thought, this is a blank canvas. I could do something with it. Yes. And yeah. jokingly thinking I could get signatures. I thought, oh, I could get signatures. And then maybe I could get things, and then maybe we could sell it. And so that's basically what right. happened. Yeah, yeah. So I wore it yeah. to every event for a month. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Literally. I mean, yeah. both award ceremonies and every party and, and event leading up to it. Yeah. And now it's it's gone to the VA. Now it's in the VA. And now it's actually on di it's now on display in the, in the VA, which is mm -hmm. absolutely So, fun. I mean, brilliantly, the, the person, Edwina Dunn, yeah. um, who is the founder of a charity called The Female Lead. Purchased yeah. it, yeah. used it for a little bit yes. to, you know, yeah. publicise her own campaign, so her yeah. own charity, yeah. and then donated it to the VA. Yeah. yeah, and have you seen it on display? I have. Yeah, yeah. Is, it look, is, it, is, it, is it looking good? It is. Yeah. 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 Was it quite strange to see it in a case? <laughs> it's, like, it's in it's in the performance and theatre uh, section, so it's in a room with lots of different other costumes and bits yeah. of. I mean, it's mostly theatre things. It's the one little corner that's. Mm. Mm. film so it, it's kind of in the theatre yeah. area which is fine you know it's yeah it's, 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 it's yeah it was a performance yeah. performance um, moment yeah. um, you've given up your Sunday afternoon by your slap bang in the middle of making Snow White at Pinewood um, we are so grateful that you've come today thank you so much for doing this ladies and gentlemen please give Sammy Powell